Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming to Grand Rounds today. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Birkins to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Dr. Swirsky is the Arthur and Janet C. Ross Professor of Medicine and Cardiology and Professor of Diagnostic Molecular and Interventional Radiology here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, as well as notably the Director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute. He has had secondary and he has secondary appointments at the Precision Immunology Institute and the Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute. Dr. Swirsky obtained his PhD at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, and postdoctoral studies at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Swirsky was professor at Harvard Medical School and principal, principal investigator at the Massachusetts General Hospital before joining us here at Mount Sinai in 2021. He focuses on fundamental and translational cardiovascular science within the context of hem uh, hematologic, immune, metabolic, and nervous systems, with special emphasis on cell development, communication, and function. Recently, however, his work has expanded, and it includes lifestyle factors such as sleep, diet, and stress as critical modulators of cardiovascular health and hematopoiesis. You're lucky because Dr. Swirsky has been recognized nationally and internationally as a leader in the field of innate immunity and inflammation and disease. He's a highly cited researcher and is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Jeffrey M. Hoag Award from the American Heart Association, the William Harvey Lecture from the European Society of Cardiology, the Martin Prize for our Fundamental Research, the Howard Goodman Fellowship, and was the Patricia and Scott Eston Research Scholar from Massachusetts General Hospital. He holds an Outstanding Investigator Award from the NHLBI, an Established Investigator Award from the AHA, an Investigator Grant from the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and is the North American Coordinator of the Leduc Foundation Transatlantic Network of Excellence Consortium. We are extremely fortunate to have him here today, and please join us in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so it's my pleasure to speak to you today. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to share the screen here. I tried this earlier, so you should be able to see. I'm going to assume that you can see the title slide of the talk. Yeah, you're good, Phil. So okay, good. fantastic. All right. So um, what I want to do for the next 45 minutes is tell you uh, a few stories uh, that are underway uh, and recently uh, published in the lab. But before doing so, uh, I would like to uh, briefly uh, outline to you the context in which um, we ask the questions that we ask and the work that we do. So, so the why, why do we do the work that we do? What is it that gets us um, excited? Uh, but but again, before doing so, just very brief introduction, as was mentioned already, you know, I'm relatively new to Sinai. I guess at some point I'm going to have to say, say uh, stop saying I'm relatively new as it's been already a year and a half. But I arrived here in um, June of 2021 from Boston to uh, lead a Cardiovascular Research Institute. Here's a logo of our institute. And, and the institute, which is located uh, predominantly on uh, has seven uh, comprises um, 16 principal investigators, students, uh, fellows, clinicians, and so on, uh, studying uh, various aspects of cardiovascular health. These are just some of the core faculty and associate faculty. So I'm, what I mean by core faculty are these those faculty whose labs are within HES 7 and associate faculty are faculty who may have primary appointments elsewhere, but their work is very much adjacent and, and very much is, is part of part and parcel of cardiovascular health and disease. And so we include them here. And these are some of the themes that the faculty at the CVRI work on. So in, just in terms of disease processes, in terms of technologies and so on. So we are a growing institute, we are recruiting, and, and we're, we're, so we're really at a, at a time of growth and, and really uh, believe that this is a very exciting time to study cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disease, um, given the many questions that are outstanding and the many technologies that we can now bear on, um, on, uh, on, on some of the questions. And really, this is a fundamental to translational institute. So it's not so much of a clinical enterprise as it is uh, one that uh, really delves in preclinical models with, with an eye on uh, translation. All right, so what I want to do is um, 
tell you a little bit about the work that I do in my lab. So in addition of, uh, to being a director of the Institute, I also still lead a lab uh, of talented postdocs and students. And, and so what I will share with you is some of the work that we do. So here really is a slide that I think captures the 30,000 foot view of the work that we do. Uh, much of the work that we are interested in can be sort of encapsulated in this idea of inter-organ communication or systemic inflammatory networks. And this is just sort of this belief that in order to understand a disease, what we need to understand is how organ systems interact with one another. And one of uh, easy way, or at least one important aspect of inter-organ communication involves immune cells. So they have really been an anchor that has driven uh, many of the questions that we've been asking, in part because uh, immune cells, and especially those that can circulate, are um, major connectors of body systems. They, they circulate in the blood, they inhabit various organs, they interact with uh, various systems, and, and so really represent a way by uh, one of the ways that the body uh, talks to, uh, has, has a sort of dialogue between various organs and various organ systems. Another reason we've been particularly interested in immune cells, white blood cells, especially innate immune leukocytes, is because of their roles uh, in cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disease. So much of the work that we've been doing has focused on cardiovascular disease, although it's not been an exclusive focus. And uh, in studying atherosclerosis or its complications, it's very clear that immune cells such as monocytes and neutrophils uh, play um, decisive roles at every stage of disease development. So atherosclerosis, which uh, used to be thought of as a uh, plumbing disorder involving lipid accumulation is now very much understood to be a lipid-driven inflammatory disease that really involves the active recruitment, differentiation, function of immune cells that, that come from the blood, but also immune cells and non-immune cells that reside in the vessel wall. And we also come to understand that uh, complications of atherosclerosis Myocardial infarction is shown on this slide, but of course, stroke is another example, involves tissue injury that then, then again involves a massive recruitment and mobilization of the immune inflammatory cascade. And because immune and inflammatory cells um, are produced in the bone marrow, the bone marrow is, has, has become a major focus of, of, of our studies, as really this is the cradle, this is their birthplace. And more recently, or at least, again, maybe not so recently, but, but certainly within the last seven or eight years, we have become particularly interested in incorporating the central nervous system and the brain in this as, as really um, a location that receives information, that perceives um, information from the periphery, but can also um, modulate responses downstream, for example, in the bone marrow. So this is really a, a sort of a groundwork uh, or a blueprint, if you will, uh, that um, animates many of the questions that we ask in the lab. And while, of course, one can look at this um, through, uh, through this prism of inter-organ communication, in order to really acquire a true mechanistic uh, insights, what we need to zoom in and uh, look at the cellular and molecular conversations that are occurring in these organs. And so uh, here is uh, a slide from a review uh, describing just really some of the key players that are involved in the maintenance uh, of hematopoietic stem cells and the production, the subsequent production of immune cells. Uh, and of course, the bone marrow uh, not, not only produces white blood cells, it also produces red blood cells, it also produces platelets. So it's a highly organized location involving multiple cell types, producing multiple cytokines that collectively guide hematopoietic stem cells along these paths of differentiation, as each of these different cell types has a very different lifespan, and of course, a different role to play in the body. Uh, the um, vasculature uh, continues to be an, uh, a location, a microenvironment of immense interest to us, uh, in part because we know that uh, rather than uh, simply a passive uh, location of lipid accumulation, it is a bustling hive of activity 
involving uh, leukocyte recruitment, um, differentiation, proliferation, uh, trans differentiation, that's uh, and sort of multiple types of mechanisms that uh, together are uh, really drive this, this long-term chronic process that sort of occurs through a lifetime and that can either lead to a stable plaque that we never really feel or, we, or that is asymptomatic or to a plaque that can erode or rupture and can lead to uh, ischemic uh, events. And so um, we, um, uh, the, the sort of the overdrive, the, the overall hypothesis here is that those immune events that occur here are consequential to the fate of anatherosclerotic lesions. And by uh, potentially manipulating some of these processes, uh, we may be able to uh, uh, decrease or um, uh, uh, the burden of cardiovascular disease. Uh, like I said, um, the consequence of atherosclerosis may be an uh, infarct uh, or a stroke, and this of, has uh, the, the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, recruitment of various leukocytes. So here is a, a cartoon that shows that as shortly after myocardial infarction, there is a massive recruitment of circulating cells, monocytes, and neutrophils, perhaps the most notable of those, these cells accumulate uh, shortly after MI, uh, and they participate in inflammation, but also oh, as the days go by, these cells participate in the reparative process. They talk to the resident cells, um, immune and non-immune cells. They remove uh, uh, dying cardiomyocytes um, through phagocytosis, through ephrocytosis, and they really lay the foundation of scars and, 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 and uh, contribute to collagen production. And, and we believe that uh, the uh, quality and uh, the quantity and quality of this response is consequential to how the wound develops and may be a major determinant of uh, prognostics for heart failure um, uh, later in life in those individuals who survive the initial acute event. Um, so, um, so that just lays you the, the sort of the biological framework. And so we're very much interested in immune cells. We're very much interested in interorgan communication and hematopoiesis. I, I briefly mentioned the brain. And so we lay this framework on, uh, on a question that um, can be encapsulated by this word um, uh, uh, exposome. And so the exposome can be defined as the measure of every exposure to which an individual is subjected to, from conception to death. There are so, the so-called general exposomes like pollution, climate change, urban environment. Uh, um, these We don't tend to, not to have as much influence over. Um, and then there's the pe personal exposome, many of which can uh, really be summarized as lifestyle factors. And here I'm showing you four such lifestyle factors, exercise, diet, sleep, and stress that we've been particularly interested in and so what I will um, spend the rest of my talk is uh, tell you about uh, two of these. And maybe at, at another time, uh, I'd be happy to, um, to talk about two of the two others that I won't be talking about today. So lifestyle factors uh, th th are important to cardiovascular health. And the question here uh, was not to um, prove or disprove that a particular lifestyle is, is beneficial or confers risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, we have uh, abundant evidence in the clinical literature, epidemiological literature, also just anecdotally. We know that uh, sleep is important. Uh, we know how we feel if we lose a night of sleep. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, abundant evidence about diet, exercise, the benefits of exercise, and, and stress, which um, which is a which is fairly complicated as it can be both beneficial and in certain forms can be detrimental. But the questions we've already been asking is again, not to determine whether a particular lifestyle factor is good or bad for you, but to uh, rather uh, ask why, why does a particular lifestyle protect us against disease? Why does it confer risk of disease? And specifically, how do these lifestyle factors or perturbations or changes in lifestyle bear on some of these uh, um, processes that I've described and I'm sort of summarizing here related to hematopoiesis, uh, leukocyte uh, uh, migration and function. 
And so what I want to do is uh, first just tell you a little bit about some of our work on sleep, and then I will tell you about uh, ongoing work on stress. So uh, why do we study sleep? Uh, wh why are we interested in sleep? We are interested because we know that we don't uh, get enough sleep. This is in the U.S., but this is a worldwide issue. And we also know that sleep deprivation or obstructive sleep apnea elevates risk for this cardiovascular phenomena, uh, so cardiovascular disease. This is fairly well described in the context of apnea, um, but apnea, of course, has the added complication of hypoxia. But it's also known through numerous studies, um, uh, among them studies here from Mount Sinai, that uh, sleep deprivation itself um, elevates risk for uh, these um, events um, uh, and phenomena. And so uh, this is uh, really a, a major motivation to understand you know, why this is happening at the tissue, uh, cellular and molecular scale. And one of the approaches that we uh, often take is to really combine tools from various disciplines. So what I mean by that is uh, tools of neuroscience that allow us to study what, what happens in, in the brain. And I will talk about that at more length, uh, along with tools from hematology and immunology that really allow us to profile the phenotype and function of hematopoietic cells as, uh, and their progeny, the immune cells, and then uh, tools of immunology and vascular biology that then allow us uh, to uh, determine the consequence of perturbations in lifestyle. So really it's a systems or a, a approach, um, by systems I mean various types of systems like the immune, the hematopoietic, nervous, uh, vascular, and even endocrine systems that, that together uh, we think give us a, sort of a, a, a rich picture of uh, the biology that, uh, that occurs here. And so what I will start is very briefly summarize a paper that I, I can't actually believe is already four years old uh, or nearly four years old, it'll, it'll be four years later this year, that was led by a post, former postdoc of mine, Cameron McAlpine. I think many of you know him. He, uh, he is currently a, an assistant professor here at the Cardiovascular Research Institute and is uh, really leading an effort to, um, uh, to study uh, uh, sleep and um, in cardiovascular disease and in Alzheimer's disease and, and really has taken on uh, the, the work uh, that he has uh, done here and, and is, is growing and, and really uh, charting new ground. And so um, uh, he's got some very interesting uh, unpublished data that, uh, uh, that uh, hopefully he'll be able to share with you at another time. So uh, just uh, because this paper is already four years old, I will just briefly uh, go to the punchline and show you the um, summary slides. So um, this really starts with um, the known uh, knowledge is that uh, atherosclerosis grows through the recruitment of lipids, accumulation of lipids and recruitment of cells. In fact, in my mouse models, you can cure the disease simply by trapping monocytes in the bone marrow or preventing their recruitment. This would not be something we would want to be doing in humans as monocytes are important for host defense, but I think it underscores the importance of these cells in the process and, and why it is important for us to study them and know more about them. So these cells, um, there are different uh, flavors of monocytes in humans and in mice. In uh, mice, uh, so-called lysic C high monocytes are predominantly the cells that uh, get recruited to lesions. Those cells are produced from uh, stem cells residing in specific bone marrow niches. And what Cameron discovered is that in those niches, there is a small population of cells, so-called pre-neutrophils, uh, that uh, produce a colony stimulating factor one, CSF1. A CSF1 is a growth factor uh, uh, for the production of monocytes and macrophages. Pre-neutrophils are not the only source of CSF1, but they are a modifiable source and, and, and an abundant source of that. And what Cameron um, observed was that in the lateral hypothalamus in the brain, this is the area that, uh, that's where the circadian clock resides. This is the area that controls appetite and sleep. There are neurons that produce the uh, hormone hypocretin. Hypocretin is a hormone that induces appetite and wakefulness. Um, and 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 what um, what Cameron um, noticed is that uh, pre-neutrophils residing in the bone marrow uh, express a hypocretin receptor that responds to hypocretin. 
And essentially what hypercretin does in this case is acts as a break on the production of CSF1. So during the day when hypercretin levels are low, um, are high, CSF1 uh, production is limited and that sort of reduces uh, the production of monocytes. But under conditions of, of sleep fragmentation that can be influenced by, of course, these various types of influencers, uh, hypocretin levels um, diminish, they, they, they are reduced. And, and as, a, as a consequence of this, the breaks are off, CSF1 levels increase, uh, that, which leads to heightened hematopoiesis, monocytosis, and heightened atherosclerosis. So here, what Cameron described really is a loop that links the brain and uh, a neuropeptide, uh, by, uh, or, uh, uh, narcolepsy, by the way, is a disease that involves uh, the autoimmune destruction of hypocretin, which you may also know as orexin. So, so here is, is a link essentially between um, a, a neuropeptide, immune cells, hematopoiesis, and atherosclerosis. And so this study described um, a molecular and cellular pathway that, of which we were unaware, but of course raised a series of questions um, uh, that uh, needed to be answered. One of these questions, of course, was does sleep increase monocyte numbers in humans? This was a, a mouse study. We do mouse work um, because it is mouse work that allows us to really get down to the cellular mechanisms as we can manipulate uh, 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 things genetically. But of course, um, the major question is to what extent the observations that we make in the mouse uh, can uh, be, are translatable to humans. And uh, in order to begin addressing this question, uh, we worked with uh, Marie-Pierre St. Ong at Columbia University, just uh, uh, 20 minutes from here, um, uh, on a human sleep restriction study. Uh, this was a very well controlled, but small study involving um, sleep restriction, a crossover study uh, that monitored sleep uh, objectively through actigraphy where individuals uh, slept fewer than uh, one and a half fewer hours per night for six weeks, uh, and, and that was um, measured. And uh, what we did here was uh, to enumerate uh, circulating cells uh, in the morning and in the evening. And what these data show is um, what we saw in the mouse, which is that in the evening, which of course mice uh, sleep at, uh, in the day and are uh, active at night, but what we can say is it's the active period versus the rest period. So as we begin the rest period in humans, what we see is this increase in monocytes in the blood in individuals subjected to sleep restriction. This was exactly what we found in the mouse. Uh, so as a mouse are be were beginning the rest period, uh, there was an increase in monocytes in the circulation. Um, there is no differences uh, at the beginning of the active period in both humans and in the mice. And we believe this is uh, because of uh, this known process of anticipatory inflammation. Monocytes are known to cycle between the blood and the tissue. And one of the reasons we don't think, uh, we don't see um, differences here is that this is a, a period during which monocytes can be found in larger numbers in peripheral organs, such as the lung, or their liver, at least circulating through those organs, and thus are less, um, uh, it, it, it's harder to get them out through simple blood withdrawals. So this at least um, told us that um, there may be similar biologies at hand, and there's ongoing work, uh, unpublished work, that uh, is, is pushing this forward to really um, uh, understand this mechanistically. This particular sleep restriction study was published uh, just a few months ago. Uh, another question that arose from the Nature paper was, you know, how long lasting are these effects of sleep fragmentation? Is this one of those abandoned all hope you who enter here? As Dante said uh, uh, at the beginning of the Inferno, uh, so, th of course, this uh, um, necessitates that we look at a rest period. There is a number of questions we can ask here. One is when we allow the mice to sleep uh, normally or habitually, uh, as the term goes, how long does it take for them for their sleep to return to normal? And, and so we can do that by measuring um, sleep um, and looking at slow wave sleep, REM sleep, and so on. And, and so the punchline here is that it actually takes a few weeks before um, mice sleep um, like they did prior 
to having sleep fragmentation, despite the fact that fragmentation has already uh, stopped. So there is a reset period uh, uh, and, uh, and, and it takes a few weeks. But the question that we were more interested in, of course, was what happens to the immune cells, which we know that during sleep fragmentation rise in number. And one way that we can uh, address this, so there's several different things we can do, but one a fairly simple way uh, is use this very old uh, classic tool of competitive adoptive transfer. So in this case, what we did is adoptively transferred uh, hematopoietic extent progenitor cell from a control mouse that was able to sleep habitually and from a mouse that was subjected to sleep fragmentation. And, um, and, and, and when you combine them in a one-to-one -one ratio and then injected them to a mouse that was never subjected to any sleep fragmentation. And what we find here is really something quite striking is that it is the cells uh, that uh, are uh, derived from this mouse that was subjected to sleep fragmentation, as you can see here with a BRDU um, staining, that are better uh, at proliferating. So they, they proliferate uh, at a higher rate. Uh, a BRDU is a nucleotide analog that incorporates itself into dividing cells and essentially outcompete the cells uh, uh, that were retrieved from uh, mice that were allowed to sleep habitually, such that after a while, if you just look at the uh, leukocytes, that are, uh, it is the leukocytes deriving from this group, the sleep fragmented group, that really sort of dominate the overall pool of leukocytes. And this is mostly in terms of uh, monocytes. So a few things that you can draw from this uh, uh, experiment. One is that there is something intrinsic that's happening to the stem cells themselves, because uh, no notice that the environment in which these stem cells find themselves uh, is, a, is a mouse that never uh, experienced sleep fragmentation. So there is, a, a, so it's, so this is not a question so much about the environment, but something maybe additional uh, that is um, intrinsic to the cells, uh, intrinsic capacity to proliferate. And the other thing that I think you can appreciate is that this is an effect that lasts for weeks. So despite the fact that these cells are now in a new environment, uh, and, and, and a mouse that is allowed to sleep habitually, there is an echo of, of sleep uh, disruption that is evident uh, weeks after bone marrow trans transfer. And so to the point about the intrinsic capacity of these cells to uh, proliferate, that of course um, uh, forces us to ask whether there are epigenetic changes that are occurring in those cells. And that's exactly what we did I am, it's a busy slide, uh, and I'll just uh, say uh, that uh, we do indeed see uh, fairly uh, uh, robust changes in the epigenome in, when looking at, for, for example, enhancers regions, um, uh, comparing control mice allowed uh, to sleep habitually, mice subjected to sleep fragmentation, and mice subjected to recovery sleep. And while certain enhancer regions go back to pre-sleep fragmentation, uh, um, levels, so to speak. Others are retained, and many of these so-called retained signatures are relevant to uh, myeloid cell differentiation and proliferation, which might perhaps explain why we have this longer effect where cells, even uh, though they are no longer uh, in, a, in an animal that is experiencing sleep fragmentation, are nevertheless continuing to proliferate at a higher rate. And again, this paper was published just a few months ago. So now I will switch gear with the uh, time that I have. I hope to cover this in about 15 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to go through some of the data uh, quickly uh, is to tell you a story about stress. Stress been, has been um, of major interest to us for a while. We've studied stress in the context of chronic stress. And, and here was a question that Wolfram Poehler, who was a postdoc in the lab in Boston, came as well to Sinai and is currently an instructor has really devoted his, uh, his postdoc years to and has worked on this question for three or so four years. And the this, this study was just uh, very recently uh, published. And really the question it was about a better understanding uh, the role of acute stress in, in the context of this kind of biology. And so what I want to do is rather than sort of take you through the data, I wanna first start with the conclusions. I want, to, I want to tell you what uh, it is that we found uh, uh, through this through this study, and then I will spend the rest of my time 
um, telling you about some of the experiments that uh, led us to these conclusions so that you can sort of decide on your, on your own whether you are convinced uh, whether we're making the correct conclusions or not. So the idea here was to, um, it, it was first to, to that stress is perceived in the brain. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to draw a link between the perception of stress, which we, which we, um, which we know uh, sort of begins uh, the sensation of it in the brain and downstream effects of that uh, perception whether those downstream effects are cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, or infection. The idea is how do we connect the dots between what happens in the brain when stress is perceived and what happens physiologically or immunologically or hematologically in peripheral organs. And so what, um, what the study showed was that um, there are specific regions in the brain that uh, 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 secrete factors that have an immense effect an immense consequence on um, leukocyte populations in the periphery. And there's a specific region here that has, has really the effect of uh, essentially relocating major leukocyte types from um, uh, major organs in the body, including the lymph node. This is a, not a kidney. This is a lymph node, although it can sometimes be confused, uh, uh, into the bone marrow. And, and so there's this mass migration of major leukocyte types from peripheral organs, the blood, the lymph node, and others, and I'll show you, into the bone marrow where they then hide. Um, conversely, at the same time, more or less, in response to acute stress, different regions of the body communicate with um, different tissues in the periphery, which procure different types of uh, uh, cytokines that have an opposing effect on different types of leukocytes. The opposing effect being that uh, uh, the, this particular region mobilizes leukocytes out of the bone marrow and into the periphery, into the blood. So you have these large scale leukocyte shifts going in opposite directions, controlled by different regions of the brain. And these are some of the key players that I will be talking about. So uh, this, this study really started with a very simple observation you know, without any sort of idea where the study is going to go. I mean, it was a, in many ways a, a study of pure uh, discovery um, wh where we had um, uh, the idea that we want to connect the dots. And we certainly, was, uh, we had some, uh, some, our favorite um, cells and uh, tissues to, that we wanted to um, profile. But really the study started with just a naive observation, which you see here which involves uh, uh, intravital microscopy um, and um, a mouse that on the top here is um, just uh, relaxed or at least is in its cage, exploring its cage. And on the bottom, a mouse that is placed into a restrainer for one hour. In fact, you can see this observation if you place the mouse into this restrainer for five minutes, provided you wait one hour to do the experiment or at least to do the microscopy. And what you can immediately appreciate here, and here we're looking at Lysix-G positive cells. So these are neutrophils. Lysix-G is a marker specific to neutrophils. Is you immediately see that there's just more cells in, in the circulation here that are patrolling, probably going through. And that was a, an intriguing observation, perhaps not particularly um, uh, surprising, uh, but uh, but certainly one that. Um, got uh, Wolfram intrigued to uh, better profile the immune cells in response to acute stress, restrained stress, and other acute stressors. And so the model here was to uh, just very simply enumerate leukocytes throughout the body in response to acute stress. Acute uh, restrained stress uh, is one is a stress that mice don't like. It induces high levels of corticosterone in the mouse. Uh, Wolfram um, tested different types of stressor and restraint is really uh, one that is particularly stressful to the mice. And what he found uh, when enumerating leukocytes throughout the body, or at least in the blood at first, is that there are two uh, uh, broad categories, uh, pattern categories. So one is a, is a pattern that we see in neutrophils where there is a rise of neutrophils. So there's development of neutrophilia that happens pretty quickly. Whereas these other major leukocytes, so lymphocytes consisting of B cells and T cells, as well as monocytes, which are cells related to neutrophils, they're myelin cells, but, but have different functions. 
uh, uh, very quickly decrease in the blood. And, and then what happens is when you have sleep recovery, on the one hand, the neutrophil numbers, that neutrophilia very quickly um, uh, resets. And, and what we find uh, very quickly after recovery is the sort of the loss of neutrophilia and we return to uh, so-called normal neutrophil numbers. But it takes quite a long time for the uh, blood to recover its numbers of monocytes, T cells, and B cells. So two distinct patterns uh, uh, that we thought were interesting and that raised a series of questions. The first of which was, well, okay, so we're seeing cells disappearing, we see them reappearing. Where are they going to? Where are they coming from? Are they dying? Are they proliferating for hematopoietic stem cells? So just in the interest of time, I'll just go to the punchline through a series of adoptive transfer experiments. What we, what we think is happening is that the neutrophilia is the consequence of mobilization out of the bone marrow. Why we think that? Because um, what we find is that in response to uh, stress, both endogenous and adoptively transferred cells increase in number in all organs except the bone marrow. This is the only place where we see a decrease. Uh, now, the, the, on a percent level, it doesn't look like a big decrease. But when you consider the number of neutrophils you have in all the bone marrow in the entire body, this is a substantial decrease that can be nearly accounted for with the increase in the other organs. And this opposite happens when we uh, consider monocytes, uh, B cells and T cells, where we find that in all organs that we tested, or nearly all organs, we see a decrease in those cells in response to stress. And the only place where there is uh, an, uh, an increase in these cells in the, is in the bone marrow. We can do this by enumerating endogenous as well as adoptively transferred cells. These cells go to the bone marrow. They don't die there, or although under certain conditions they can. But in this case, uh, in response to stress and recovery, they actually reside there temporarily and then over time return back uh, to the bone marrow. And we, can, we are confident that this is the case because we're tracking GFP positive cells. So, so that um, eliminates the, the possibility of hematopoiesis because it's, it's, a, it, it's a tracking experiment, um, a post-chase experiment where, where we know the cells that we have put it in. What's interesting here, and this becomes quite relevant to the consequences of this, you know, why is this important? Why should we care about this? Is that when we look at uh, what happens uh, to a repopulation of lymph nodes and, and to a lesser extent the spleen, it really takes a long time, even though the stressor was acute, uh, a, a fairly brief, for these B cells and T cells to repopulate uh, lymph nodes, to repopulate the secondary lymphoid organs. And this has consequences on acquisition of um, immune memory, on, uh, on acquisition uh, of, of, uh, of sensitization to viruses and uh, in acquisition um, of um, sensitization to autoantigens that I will just very briefly mention. So uh, this was the phenomenon. This was uh, really the observation. And this is where all the fun work started, which was how can we explain this? Uh, and how do we, again, I, I use this word, uh, this term, connect the dots from the brain uh, to the rest of the body. And at first, it was very clear to us that uh, we cannot move forward without considering the, the, the two low-hanging fruits, the two major stress systems that we thought were likely culprits, the HPA axis, which begins in the paraventricular or hypothalamus, and the, and the uh, sympathetic nervous system, uh, which, which uh, can, uh, by some measures, be sort of thought to originate although, uh, in the rostroventral lateral medulla. And of course, these systems are connected, but nevertheless, they do have distinct roles and, and, distinct, um, and, and distinct pathways by which they communicate with the periphery. And so, and so the question was here, are these uh, two systems uh, cooperating? Are they controlling these leukocytes differentially, uh, sequentially? You know, what's going on? We wanted to understand this. And so our first insight uh, was very clear uh, and very unambiguous was that the HPA axis is responsible for the lymphocyte and monocyte exit from the blood. We did this using the surgical, pharmacological, and genetic means at first. So adrenalectomy, as well as corticosterone, told us that, in fact, this is the axis that is playing a role in B-cell, T-cell, and, and monocyte um, 
uh, um, disappearance from the blood, but is not contributing to the neutrophilia. So already we had a clue that neutrophils might be operating via different mechanism. We did this uh, down, down looking at sort of the, the downstream mechanisms by generating mice that specifically lack the glucocode receptor from specific immune cells. So in this case, the glucocode receptor was deleted from B cells. These are CD19 cells. And we see we no longer have that drop, but we have the drop in other cells. Same with T cells and same with myeloid cells. And with these um, observations, that really motivated us to implement more sophisticated tools of neuroscience, chemogenetics and optogenetics that Wolfram, through his experience, uh, although Wolfram is a cardiologist, he was um, uh, he spent some time in a neuroscience lab, was able to implement in the lab. So for those of you who may be less familiar with chemo and optogenetics, very quickly, uh, th th this, uh, these methods uh, really require three ingredients. One is a way to access specific brain regions using stereotactic surgery, but also some kind of map, an atlas that allows you to access a, a region of, of interest. Two, you need genetically engineered mice, preferably those where there is a Cree recombinase under a promoter of a, a neuropeptide or some um, rate-limiting uh, enzyme like tyrosine hydroxylate, uh, hydroxylase, which is a rate-limiting enzyme. Um, for catecholamine synthesis or, or CRH, which is a hormone. So this allows you to potentially then express Cree recombinase in, um, in, in particular neurons. Um, and then the last uh, key uh, element um, of chemogenetics is that you need viral vectors that encode a specific uh, receptors that can be specifically stimulated. So in the case of chemogenetics, these viral vectors have these designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. These are these G-protein transmembrane, seven transmembrane uh, uh, coupled receptors that um, uh, can then be expressed in specific regions of the brain, in specific mice, and then in response to the delivery of our otherwise inert drug and close up uh, pin and oxide, these uh, receptors can either uh, stimulate uh, or excite or inhibit uh, neuronal activity. And, and so this is a very a powerful means to really uh, test how uh, activation or excitation or inhibition of specific neurons is, uh, in specific regions you know, affects um, whatever it is that you're asking. Uh, um, chemogenetics is this viral, um, optogenetics is the same thing, except, in, uh, except instead of G-protein couple receptors, you are uh, in injecting viral vectors that encode channel rhodopsins, so then you can excite or inhibit neural activity with light. So just a brief primer on chemo and optogenetics. Um, here's uh, more or less what can be done. Here's a mouse, a mouse brain. We have a, a mouse that expresses Cre uh, under the CRH promoter, and we're targeting the paraventricular hypothalamus, injecting an activating virus. We know that we have expression of um, of, uh, uh, of what we've injected here because we also encode M-cherry in this virus. And so it's red and specifically in the region of interest. After three weeks of recovery, we can then inject uh, this inert um, chemical that will, uh, in this case, because it's an activating virus, will activate these uh, only neurons that otherwise produce um, corticotropin-releasing hormone it's only in the paraventricular hypothalamus. And then we can ask, you know, what's happening after that. And so this is just a, um, uh, what, I, um, what I just showed you. So uh, just a summary. And so if we do this, and, and then we, uh, for example, just look at the mouse, uh, we find that its corticosterone levels are high. And then we see a decrease in B cells, T cells, and monocytes. In fact, we see a decrease in neutrophils, which again tells us that the neutrophilia that we see in response to stress is not uh, being um, uh, controlled by this. In fact, it's probably that very fast decline of neutrophilia uh, when uh, stress uh, is uh, uh, ends that may be responsible for this. We can do the uh, con uh, uh, converse experiment and instead of activating this region, actually ablate this. One can do this with an ablating virus encoding caspase 3. Then you can stress the mice all you want. Corticosterone levels remain low and you're unable to sort of decrease uh, B cells. One can actually circumvent 
the, the, the um, up to the chemogenetics in this case specifically by using the Zimpli mouse where uh, it's, it's a mouse that specifically lacks CRH uh, neurons. And here we phenocopy what you saw with the ablating virus. So this really told us, I think, very clearly that the HPA axis is specifically this cluster, this small cluster of neurons located in the paraventricular hypothalamus has this very dramatic uh, uh, and, uh, um, and very, very quick effect on the major uh, leukocyte uh, subsets. And then I think just in the last few minutes, because I, I certainly want to have time for questions, um, I will I will speak about the remaining. So of course one can uh, do this and ask not just what happens in the paraventricular hypothalamus, but start building a salience network using mono and polysynaptic retrograde tracing. So you can ask fascinating questions about memory and learning behavior and uh, and inputs from other uh, brain centers and how they uh, bear on stress response, resilience, susceptibility, and so on and so forth. All right, so just a summary here. So the uh, this particular region in the brain, we believe, is, is it has a major impact on the um, mobilization or reverse mobilization, if you will, of uh, major leukocyte types out of the periphery, out of the lymph nodes, into the bone marrow where they hide for a period of time. And this has an effect, and I don't have time to show this, on sensitization to... To the virus, we did this in the context of SARS-CoV-2, as well as sensitization to autoimmunity. It sort of decreases that because these cells are not present during uh, uh, during um, when the virus is introduced. The question is, you know, how do we account for neutrophils? How do we understand neutrophilia? The low-hanging fruit here has always been the sympathetic nervous system, and that's clearly how we set out these experiments. Uh, we thought that surely. We, uh, given what we know about the sympathetic nervous system's role in the bone marrow, we can find tyrosine hydroxylase there during uh, chronic stress. Um, we know that the SNS uh, induces proliferation. Um, uh, surely, uh, uh, the SNS is going to be an important contributor to mobilization of neutrophils. But no matter what we did, and this took months, um, uh, including uh, experiments uh, uh, ablating the SNS, using uh, alpha blockers, beta blockers, using knockout mice. This is in collaboration with the late Paul Frenette, uh, who passed away last year, um, as well as uh, adrenalectomy and even optogenetics. We were unable to, to link the uh, neutrophilia that we uh, saw in response to acute stress to the sympathetic nervous system. So these were very disappointing results. Nothing that we did sort of jived and made sense and so that the, these results really forced us to go back to the drawing board. Ultimately, these data uh, now occupy a supplemental figure. And so we, we thought, you know, how do we get around this? How do we, you know, what, what region could be important? We went back down to basics and reasoned that if we have neutrophilia, uh, and that neutrophilia may be um, elicited at least in a most immediate way by a chemokine that perhaps attracts these monocytes um, and mobilizes them. And so uh, we measured a series of chemokines, cytokines, and so on. And one that, that came uh, to our attention was CXCL1, because this is a known neutrophil uh, chemokine. And in fact, we saw that the, uh, uh, that the uh, time course of uh, CXCL1 uh, that, um, in the blood mirrors nicely and just slightly precedes the time course of neutrophilia. And really the killer here was the, the first observation after months of failed experiments uh, that um, where we uh, where we used an inhibitor to CXCR2 and found that you know for the first time in response to acute stress we were unable to see neutrophilia or this may be uh, I should say better um, neutrophilia was blocked with uh, blocking this inhibitor so this told us that this might be uh, an important uh, piece of the puzzle. And uh, that led us to another experiment, which was, you know, what is the source of this uh, uh, cytokine? And so the source of the cytokine was uh, already sort of um, the Rosetta Stone or the, or the piece that got us uh, excited about what potential brain may be um, relevant, because a major source of the cytokine was skeletal muscle, as you see here. Not the only source, but certainly a notable source. We, and we saw that this actually uh, CXCO, this uh, CXCO one was actually being produced rather than stored in skeletal muscle, which uh, led us to a series of experiments asking whether it's innervation of the muscle and whether it's the motor cortex. And this uh, involved um, doing um, 
a number of uh, 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 experiments involving optogenetics and involving the use of muscle relaxants, all in all, just to cut to the chase, what we um, what we observed here was that uh, the motor cortex, uh, um, a part of the brain involved in, in, in motor function, was what um, was eliciting neutrophilia. And so this led us to the conclusion. Now, the motor cortex in the mouse is different than the humans. It's not located just in one area, but it converges. And, and the idea here is that the stressful response um, uh, elicited uh, production of CXCO1 via innervation of the muscle and consequently neutrophilia. And the, this, had, this had consequences on um, the um, response to infection, but also, and actually this was not part of the study, but is part of ongoing work on um, what happens in atherosclerosis. Neutrophil neutrophils are known to accumulate in lesions they accumulate in specific shoulder regions and may be, as, as important sources of myeloperoxidase, may be very important in, uh, in uh, eliciting um, uh, plaque instability. And, and perhaps this might uh, give us clues as to why very stressful situations, very acute stress, might lead, uh, this help one at least mechanism of many, might uh, to uh, heart attacks or strokes because but it's potentially, and this is a working hypothesis, the neutrophilia that uh, occurs uh, after a stressful um, event uh, may uh, lead to um, very uh, rapid uh, destabilization of a plaque, which may lead to rupture or erosion. So with that, I will end. Uh, this um, is the lab. In fact, it's actually a picture that needs updating as there's uh, new members and others have left and, and members that have their own labs now. So, so here is Cameron who's done the work on sleep and, and again continues to work on sleep and on neuroimmune interactions in cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. Wolfram, who is continuing work on um, stress and others in the lab and uh, who, have, who are working on the role of, of diet. Uh, so that's Henrika, just a paper that was just accepted a few days ago. Uh, stress, um, viral infection, sleep and and um, stress inoculation. So there is all sorts of work that broadly coalesces around this theme of lifestyle factors, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, uh, the immune system, nervous system, and uh, the hematopoietic system all sort of responding to those interventions. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and um, maybe there's a few minutes for questions. I'd be happy to uh, try at least to answer them uh, should you have any. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Phil. There is um there is a comment and a question in the chat. If you can see that, you can read it if you'd like. So it's a orexin increases steroidogenesis enzyme expression in the adrenals. Um, steroids induce sleep disturbances. Increase um, orexin. What blocks this cycle? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, what we do know is that, of course, that there are, there is these, these uh, mechanisms are clearly linked. Uh, what we saw um, in response to sleep fragmentation is a reduction in orexin. We also saw an increase in NPY. Uh, we, we, we did profile, you know, a series of neurotransmitters uh, and, 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 um, you know, it's, it's it's clear that the um, physiological effects are complicated, and uh, uh, you know what what we focused on here was the link between orexin or hypocretin and uh, specifically hematopoiesis. But but clearly, um, much uh, can be done and needs to be done in terms of better sort of understanding how orexin plugs into some of these other. Um, uh, metabolic um, si uh, other systems, whether it's metabolic, nervous, uh, endocrine, and so on. Uh, what what I can tell you is that what we have now is really good model systems to study orexin and its receptor. You know, the orexin has two receptors: receptor one, receptor two. Receptor one is exclusively expressed in the hypothalamus and mediates a lot of the effects on sleep. Receptor two, which is mostly uh, expressed in the hypothalamus is also expressed in the periphery. I mentioned the neutrophils, uh, but also in the gut. Uh, we, we don't know anything about that. Um, you know, I think that it's just there are so many questions uh, and so many good ideas 
um, that you know I wish we could answer all of them, but then you know we're bound by the rea- the financial realities uh, <laughs> that, and, and, and <laughs> time. Uh, so so great questions, and you know I I'd be happy to sort of uh, uh, explore these ideas uh, and unpack them a bit more. Um, because, uh, you know, it's always, it's always people bring their ideas specifically, you know, those who have ideas from the clinic uh, can really sort of ask uh, tremendously important questions. So another um, question, when considering acute stress, I see how neutrophil mobilization is adaptive, but what is the adaptive aspect of lymphocyte sequestration in the bone marrow? So that, you know, this sort of raises uh, what I, what I guess, um, by adaptive is you know so if i if i'm understanding this question the question here is you know how what is the advantage of this you know how does this phenomenon evolved and how can we understand it so so we can see that neutrophil mobilization is a form of um an adaptive form of uh, uh adapting uh, towards a potential uh, uh, the potential danger, you know, acute stress is, you know, one way we can think about it is is a is a physiological or, or it's, it's, it's perceived and induces a, a physiological responses that allow us to deal with uh, incoming danger that may be harmful physically, right? And this is why we have fight, flight, or or or, or freeze as as major known consequences of of, of acute stress. And so we can sort of understand neutrophilia as, as being a sort of a, a, a phenomenon whereby these cells that are really first at the site of injury or bacterial infection <clears throat> are being strategically recruited from the bone marrow to the periphery where they can essentially await the potential danger that may be incoming. And the sort of that makes, um, that makes some sense. The, um, it's less intuitive. Uh, how we, you know, how can we sort of understand the um, the sequestration of B cells and T cells out of uh, the various uh, locations and into the bone marrow? And there are a number of different ways that we've thought about it. Uh, I will share with you two. You know, do you take it or leave it, whether you believe in this or not? Uh, th- these are hypotheses. The phenomenon exists, and, and we can only speculate as to why these uh, processes have evolved. So the first uh, the, the first is, uh, we think, to, to lower the threshold of auto activation. So during, so let me explain what I mean by that. And, and when you have um, a physical injury and the tissue destruction, that has the uh, possibility of um, revealing autogens, uh, antigens, self antigens that would otherwise not be potentially presented in the thymus. And so uh, you know, so you have the sort of the possibility of. Um, revealing new antigens, you know, which is the basis of autoimmune diseases. You know, the reason why we have, uh, 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 with the exception of type one diabetes, there's sort of remission and resurgence because that is sort of believed as when new antigens are revealed when you have tissue destruction. So the idea here may be that when you uh, w- w- when you reduce the amount of B cells and T cells that you have in the lymph nodes what uh, you reduce that threshold of activation. And so uh, when there is injury and inevitably injury will involve the uh, um, the uh, accumulation of antigens in the lymph nodes as part of the repair process, um, you, you can sort of decrease that activation and lessen the burden of autoimmune disease. And that's what we saw. We modeled this uh, by doing a model of uh, mouse model of multiple sclerosis. And stressed mice had surprisingly less uh, um, uh, were, were less uh, sensitized to that antigen. So that's one sort of way. You, the consequence is that you may not be responding very well to, to the virus. The other, the other uh, part, uh, way of thinking about this is that it's a, a, a mechanism that protects B cells and T cells. Uh, uh, the body does quite a bit of work to... Um, uh, to produce B cells and T cells more, I would say, the neutrophils. Neutrophils are, are, are and even monocytes, which, which perhaps is an exception, exception to this idea, are produced daily and, and, and they're quickly produced and they come out of the bone marrow fully formed. Um, monocytes may actually become macrophages, but neutrophils, as far as we know, are fully formed and, and they live briefly. T cells and B cells go through a pretty rigorous process. You know, they leave the bone marrow 
They mature um, in the thymus for T cells in secondary lymphoid organs. There's affinity maturation. It, it takes time to replenish them. They live for a long, long time. And uh, acute stress uh, has a, um, in one of the consequences of acute stress may be metabolic. There may be um, uh, a dearth of, of, of metabolites. Uh, there, there may be um, um, issues with sort of glucose availability. And so there is that, a potential sense that they're going to the bone marrow, to, uh, which is a safe haven to hide and weather the storm. They don't all go to the bone marrow. So it's not like there is none of them elsewhere. But, but, but it's a way for the body to preserve some of its key um, um, uh, um, cells uh, during a, a time of danger and potential metabolic crisis. Again, completely speculative. This is just uh, in thinking about how we could potentially explain these phenomena. Thank you, Phil. And that brings us to the end of our hour. But I would like to mention that Dr. Schwersky did not read Dr. Chen's comment, which was beautiful body of work, which I think is a very appropriate way to close our grand rounds. Phil, just, just amazing work, and Phil, just terrific. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for joining. Uh, Thank bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.